Hi friends and welcome to this video. In this video we're looking at the science 2017 GCE paper 1, so meaning this is physics. Um, in an earlier video we looked at section A, but in this video we will, con we will concentrate on um, tackling section B questions. And so let us get into this paper. So in, the, in an earlier video we looked at section A of this paper, and in this video we will concentrate at um, we'll concentrate on looking at question uh, section B. So section B um, is allocated 45 marks and you are expected to answer all questions in this section. So here is our B1. So B1 uh, shows part of uh, the venia calipers. I believe we must all be acquainted with um, the venia calipers and what type of an instrument it is. So in this question B1, we're given a figure of the venia calipers and here's part of that figure. And the question goes on to say, what is the reading of the venia calipers? What is the reading of the venia calipers? So well, we know that this is eight, and this is nine, meaning right before the eight, we had a seven somewhere there. Do we agree? So we have a seven somewhere this side. Okay, so meaning this is seven point something. So this is seven point. So this is eight. So meaning this is nine. This is eight. If we look at how many graduations we have between eight and nine, we find that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So similarly, between eight, seven, and eight, we had nine graduations. So meaning this is the ninth one. So this is seven point nine, right? Then for the next digit, we'll have to look at these graduations down here and look at the one that is coinciding with the graduations on top. So we've got 7.9 foot one, we've got two, we've got three, we've got four, we've got five. So the fifth one is the one that is kind of, that is coinciding with um, with, with, with a graduation in, on the main scale. So the fifth reading in the venia scale is in a straight line with the fifth, with, with a reading on the main scale. So this is 7.9, 7.95. So the correct answer to the reading to section B1A is 7.95. And what units do we allocate or what units do we use? We are using centimeters. So 7.95 centimeters. And we can move on to section to question B1B, which says write in words SI units for the following quantities and state their symbols. So write in words SI units for the following physical quantities and state their symbols. So the SI units for velocity are what are the SI units for velocity? The SI units for velocity are meters per meters per second. So don't make the mistake of saying um, kilometers per hour. No, the SI units are meters per second. And the SI unit symbol is small m forward slash second. For temperature, what do we have? For temperature, the SI units are kelvins. So we write kelvin. And the SI unit symbol is a capital K. So the SI units for acceleration are meters per second squared. So meters per second squared. So you have to write the squared in words, but since we do not have space, we just write that. So meters per second squared. And the symbol is meters S s to the power 2. And that is how you go about question B1B. And we can move on to B2. B2 says what is the, what is the difference between density and relative density? What is the difference between density and 
relative density. So firstly, what is density? Density is simply defined as another formula for density here. Yeah? The formula for density is mass over volume. So density is therefore defined as the mass, the ratio between mass and volume of a substance or of a body. And then what is relative density? Relative density can be seen as um, the ratio of the density of one object compared to that of a different object. So when you're dealing with density, you're simply dealing with the density of that object alone. But when you deal with relative density, you're dealing with um, the density of that object compared to the density of a different object. So how, how would we put that in writing? We would say density density is okay, so due to space I'm going to write it in a shorter way. Density is ratio between mass don't know I've written between so density is ratio of density is ratio or we can say between between mass and volume of body while on the other hand Relative density, which I'll denote with the RD, is ratio is ratio between density of body density of one body um, and that of another. that of other body. So when you're dealing with density, it's one body that you're looking at. But when you deal with, deal with um, relative density, you're comparing the density of one body to the density of a different body. We can look at B2B. B2B says, figure B2.1 shows a cuboid container that has five centimeter square base and contains water to a height of six centimeters so you have five centimeters squared meaning it's its area at the base is five centimeters squared which is 25 so five and five and then its height is it, the, the height of water in that cuboid is six centimeter and the question goes on further to say b1 says what is the volume of the water what is the volume of the water so volume is simply equal to length times breadth times height right and we know that area is simply equal to L times B here so the area at the at the at the, at the base is simply the length multiplied by the base and what do we have we've got 5 multiplied by 5 and what is our height 6 so we can simply replace those values into the formula for volume and we will have 5 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 6. So 5 by 5 gives us 25 and 25 by 6 gives us 150 centimeters cubed. So 150 and our units are centimeters. So we've got centimeter multiplied by centimeter gives you squared multiplied by another centimeter gives you cubed and so we have centimeter cubic, centimeter to the power three. And question two says, a stone is immersed into the water in the cuboid, causing the water to rise to a height of eight centimeter. Determine the volume of the stone. A volume is, a stone is immersed into the volume, into the water in the cuboid, causing the water to rise to a height of eight centimeter determine the volume of the stone so what we have is firstly um, water that has a volume of 150 centimeters cubed 
150 centimeters cubed, but then we are asked to determine the volume of a stone that has been immersed. And this, this, this stone has made the water to rise to a height of 8 centimeters. Okay? So how do we go about finding the volume of the stone alone? So we've got volume equal to length multiplied by breadth multiplied by height, right? And we've got our length still being 5, our breadth still being 5, and our height being 8. Okay? And when we compute that, we will have 5 by 5 by 8. This gives us 200. So the new volume is 200 centimeters cubed. But is that our final volume? Is that the volume of the stone? No. That's the volume of the stone combined with the volume of the water. So how do we find the volume of the stone, of the stone alone? So to find the volume of the stone alone, we we'll say this volume minus the volume of the water. So 200 minus 150, which gives us 50 centimeters cubed. And that is the volume of the stone. So we can move on to B2C. And the question says, if the mass of the stone is 80 grams, calculate the density of the stone. If the mass of the stone is 80 grams, calculate the density of the stone. So we know that density is equal to mass over volume. We've got our mass being 80 grams. We've got our volume being 50 right and when we divide 80 by 50 we get 1.6 and what units do we have grams per centimeter cubed so our density is 1.6 grams per centimeter cubed okay i hope we are together and we can move on to question b Three. Question B3 says, figure B3.1 shows a ramp being used to lift a box, a box weighing 480 newtons through a distance of 3 meters and a height 1 meter by applying force, by applying a force of 200 newtons. So we've got um, this distance 3 meters and this is the distance that the box is moving but it's going up a height of one meter and we've been given the weight of the box alone which is 480 newtons and we've been given the force that is being applied to lift this box from this point to that point then the first question says state the meaning of the term simple machine so when we talk of a simple machine, a simple machine is simply anything that will help you to, to, to do more with less, with less energy, with less input, that will help you to increase, to, 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 to deliver a certain output with less input. So what I'm trying to say is that if you would need um, 500 um, newtons to raise a spoon, using your hand, if you find a piece of, of, of or a system that will help you lift that spoon with only 20 newtons, then that system that is helping you lift that spoon is termed as a simple machine. So now, how can you put that in words? So we can say that a simple machine, so a simple machine, is any system is any system that reduces 
that reduces the effort needed to do work. The effort needed to do work. So machines simply make our lives better, meaning we would need less energy to do a certain amount of work. Then the next question says, calculate the mechanical advantage of the ramp shown in figure B3.1. Calculate the mechanical advantage of the ramp shown in figure B3.1. So when you're dealing with ramps and you're asked to find the mechanical advantage, mechanical advantage in the ramp is simply given by, so mechanical advantage being MA is given by or is equal to um, the distance divided by the height. The distance being the distance being moved by um, this box, which is three, and the height being one meter. So in this case, our mechanical advantage will be the distance being three over one, and this gives us three. So therefore, the mechanical advantage of this ramp is three. Calculate the efficiency of the ramp. Calculate the efficiency of the ramp. So when you talk of efficiency, when you talk of efficiency, efficiency is simply given as or given by um, the output divided by the input. So this is the ratio of the output to, between the output and the input. And this is given as a percentage, so multiplied by 100%. But in this case, what is our output? So our output is simply you lifting this box to this height. And so we know that work is given by force times distance, right? So in this case, you are simply lifting this force of the box up a distance of one meter. That is the work that you're doing. And so this would be given by, so let's say, let's call it work, uh, work output, not work input. So work output, work all, is equal to force times distance. We've been given the weight or the force of the box to be 480, and it's going up a distance of one um, one meter. So we will have 480 joules as the work done or as the work output. And then to find the work input, WI, we will say it's equal to force multiplied by the distance. Then what force and what distance are we having as our input? So you are requiring a force of 200 newtons. So that is your input. And the distance that you're moving with these 200 newtons is three meters. So therefore, our work input is simply equal to force times distance, which is 200 multiplied by the distance, which is three meters. And 200 multiplied by three gives us 600 joules. So therefore, our efficiency is given by our output being 480 divided by our input being um, 600 and this being expressed as a percentage, so multiplied by 100%. This gives us 480 divided by 600 will give you 0 0.8, multiplied by 100 will give you 80%. So therefore our efficiency or the efficiency of this simple machine or the efficiency of the ramp is 80 percent okay really hope we're not moving too fast so if you do not understand a certain concept please feel free to leave a comment or you can um, find you can find us on facebook you can find us on um, various social media platforms and you would you would leave a question and we'll be able to help and offer clarity where needed. 
You can also um, get more clarity via the app, which is the eSchool app, which is available on Play Store and soon to be available on Apple Store. So feel free to ask questions and we will clarify what we can. And so we can move on to question B4. Question B4 says, figure B4.1 shows a glass syringe with a sealed tip containing a gas at an initial pressure of 360 pascals, PA being pascals, placed in hot water. After a few minutes, the piston in the syringe moved up. So this being the piston, this is a syringe, you know what a syringe is? I hope so. So a syringe is simply those injections that you have at the hospital without the needle being there. So you've got a piston, you've got a syringe, you've got a sealed tip. So it's sealed there at the bottom. Okay? And then we've got hot water and we've got gas in there. Then question B4A says, using kinetic theory, explain why the piston in the syringe moved up moved upwards when the syringe was placed in hot water. Using kinetic theory, explain why the piston in the syringe moved upwards when the syringe was placed in hot water. So firstly, we need to understand what the kinetic theory states or what the kinetic theory is. So the kinetic theory of matter is simply a theory that, that, that states that um, particles in any given matter are in constant motion and due to this, uh, these particles will keep on moving and will never rest. So they will, they will always be um, bombarding and colliding to each other and these particles will always be in motion. So now how is this connected to this setup that we have here? And how is it connected to it, to, to, to the water being hot? So you know that when, um, when, when, when particles are subjected to a certain level of energy, to a certain level of heat, they will tend to move faster and so they will collide even more. So going by, by the kinetic theory, we will know that the particles in matter will be in constant motion, yes, and the degree of motion or the amount of motion that will be exhibited by those particles is highly dependent, not fully, but highly dependent on the energy in the particular matter. So it is highly dependent on the heat that is in that particular matter. So when there is more heat, these particles will collide more, they will move more, they will vibrate even more. And so if they are vibrating even more, they will cause a certain level of, um, of, 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 of uh, movement that will affect the gas in here and will affect, will in turn affect the pistons, the, the, the pistons uh, level and to, to actually move upwards. So what can we say or how can we put that in words? So we can say according to the kinetic theory of matter, um, particles in any given matter will always be subjected to motion. And this degree of motion is highly dependent on the energy or the heat that is in that particular matter. So therefore, particles will move faster when placed in hot water. So looking at the space that we have, we can only write or we can write uh, particles move faster in high temperatures. Though this is not the full explanation, the full explanation, as I said, is that particles are in constant motion, one, two, they will move faster in, in high temperatures, and three, due to that movement, they will affect the movement of the particles in the syringe, the gas particles in the syringe. Question B says, the piston was pushed downwards to 20 centimeter cubed while the temperature was kept constant. 
In terms of the kinetic theory, explain why the pressure of the gas in the syringe increases. So the piston was pushed down, downwards. So if we can look at that, our piston is at 60, but it was most pushed downwards to 20. And the temperature was kept constant. So in terms of the kinetic theory, explain why the pressure of the gas in the syringe increases. Explain why the pressure of the gas in the syringe increases. So again, we know that according to the kinetic theory, uh, particles are in constant motion. And since they're in constant motion, um, they will keep on bombarding into each other. And um, when, when you increase, when you decrease the volume, or you are decreasing the space in which these particles will bombard into each other, you find that they will have no space to, to, to actually be free to move. And because of that, they will be pressured and, and the vibrations will keep on, will, will be constant, but then there'll be a lot of pressure because there's not as much space as, they, as there was. So in terms of the kinetic theory, we can write pressure increases Pressure increases because more particles are packed in a small space. If we run out of space here. Uh, in a small space, hence they will be limited, hence movement will be limited. Okay, we've run out of space, but uh, the, the, the movement will be limited, but the movement will still be there. So they will be pressuring, they will be trying to create space, which is in turn increasing the pressure in the syringe. Then the last question says, calculate the pressure of gas in the syringe. So after you've decreased the pressure, you've decreased the volume um, to 20 centimeter cubed, calculate the pressure in the syringe. Calculate the pressure of the gas in the syringe. So what is this calling for? This is calling for us to remember one of the most important laws or most important um, uh, principles in pressure in, a, in, in gases. So you need to remember to say pressure in a gas will be constant. Oh, sorry, not pressure in a gas. Um, a gas that is, that is in a certain container at a certain uh, pressure or a certain volume will have the product of pressure and volume being equal to a constant. So if you change the volume, it simply means that it simply means that the pressure will increase. If you decrease the volume, the pressure will increase. If you increase the pressure, the volume will increase, will, will decrease. So these, these two are inversely proportional. So meaning that when one goes up, the other one comes down. But the product of these two will always be the same, no matter what you change. So meaning that the pressure at one multiplied by the volume at one is equal to the pressure at two multiplied by the volume at two. So let us look at what we had. At the beginning, we had a pressure of 360 pascals and um, a volume of 60. So we'll say our pressure at one was 360 and our volume at one was 60, 60. This is equal to our pressure at two, and that is what we're looking for, multiplied by our volume at two, which is 20. So we can simply say pressure at two equals 360 multiplied by 60 divided by 20. This zero and that zero can go, 2 there is 1, 2 there is 3, and 3 multiplied by 36 
will give us um, 180, will give us 108 rather, so 108 plus that zero that remained there, we'll have 1080. And what are the units for pressure? Pressure was given by Pascal, so we have our pressure being equal to 1080 Pascals. 1080 PA. And we can move on to B5. Question B5 says, figure B5.1 shows various regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we've got KLM, visible light, we've got ultraviolet light, we've got N, and we've got O. Remember the electromagnetic spectrum? So the electromagnetic spectrum is simply a spectrum that uh, contains electromagnetic waves and these are different from K to L to M to V to U to N to O and what differentiates them are their wavelengths so these things have got these these waves have got different wavelengths but they have the same velocity that's what brings them together so what brings them together is their velocity but what separates them is or yeah, is or are their wavelengths. So what is the name of component N? So where is N? N is right here, right? Is here and it's immediately after ultraviolet. So what wave, what type of a wave is, has um, a wavelength that is right next to ultraviolet? And so we should know to say N is representing X-ray. So X-rays is component N. Then question B says, give one practical use of region M. Region M is there, but first before we even uh, talk about the use of region M, what is region M? Region M is infrared. Now grade 12, what is infrared used for? What is infrared used for or where is infrared used for? So firstly, infrared is what is used in um, remote controls. Now, how would you put that in writing? So one practical use of infrared is for short range communication. Short range communication. And this is in remote controls. So what, that is one of the most practical uses of infrared. Another use that you can talk of is in, um, in thermal image cameras. So infrared is also used in cameras to detect um, where the presence of, 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 of human beings or presence of hot bodies and whatnot. So thermal image cameras use infrared. I believe you use those filters when you're using Snapchat, you're using um, InShot, you're using different camera apps, you find that there are certain um, filters that will be able to, to, to let you know to say there's, there's a human being here and, and whatnot. So those use thermal image um, identification which is one practical use of infrared. Question C, state one property which is the same for electromagnetic waves, for all electromagnetic waves. So we talked about this, we said the unifying thing about electromagnetic waves is that they have the same velocity, the same speed. So um, electromagnetic waves have the same speed. So speed is a unifying factor for electromagnetic waves and the, the, the differentiating factor is wavelength. Question D says, state one possible source of the radiation from region O. So now what is region O? Where is region O? Region O is there. What 
is region O. Region O is simply denoting um, gamma rays. Gamma rays. And the question is saying, state one possible source of the radi radiation from region O. So, the, the possible source of radiation, um, so one source of gamma rays is from, um, from nuclear reactions. nuclear reactions apart from nuclear reactions um, gamma rays can also be emitted by radioactive nuclei radioactive radioactive nuclei nuclei I don't know how you pronounce that nuke um, lay nuclei so possible where sources of gamma rays is from nuclear reactions and also radiations or radioactive nuclei. And that is where we end in this video. And in the next video, we'll continue from B, B7. And uh, for B6, we'll probably have, we will have a separate video tackling B6. So this is where we end in this video and thank you very much for taking the time to watch and please remember to subscribe, remember to download the eSchool app and remember to tell your friends about this education opportunity that you have been offered. So thank you very much and